Bingo! One o'clock rock. <laughs> research in Manoa, we explore everything about research in Manoa. And Margot Edwards, PhD, is our special person who we communicate with and see and enjoy all the time. She represents, she's iconic. She represents, at least in large part, research in Manoa. Welcome to the show, Margot. Thanks, Jay. Good to be back. <laughs> Thanks for coming down. And can we, we have two students. We have Jay Chitness and Nalo Eman. And uh, they are students at SOEST, and they are involved in an interesting pro project offshore. And I'd like Margot to introduce them. So Jay and Nalo and I met about a year ago, a little over a year ago. We had received some funding from an organization in Houston, Texas, that was working with the space station. And they were going to be receiving what are called automatic identification signals, or AIS, from an antenna that's on the space station. And they were wondering if there was something that they could do with Hawaii. So they're businessmen. They're very interested in shipping through the Gulf of Mexico. Interesting. Obviously, they're in Houston. but This is not pure academic now. It's yeah. not. It's applied science, right? Yeah, yeah. But they came to us and they said, do you have an idea of something that we could do for the larger ocean, and I was involved with the illegal fishing project, and I said, "Oh, you've been involved in lots of ocean yeah, things. You yeah. have." <laughs> so I said, "You know, I think that we could do this." And so they gave me some funding so that I could I could get some students involved in this project, and I sent out this announcement to students in our uh, global environmental science program, and. Uh, three or four brave young people came by and said, I'd like to be That's involved great. with That's your project. Great. It was because Margo was involved, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason. <laughs> well, so now what's happened since then? What, what, let me ask them. What's happened since then? So you signed up for this really interesting and offshore project about illegal fishing. Do you care a lot, you know, personally, morally about illegal fishing? Well, I think everybody really should care about illegal Why? fishing because fish are, every, every resource that we have on earth is so limited and obviously fish are limited too. So that's the whole illegal and unreported fishing is just, it just... It's an insult it, to the environment. It, it's an insult to an environment and yeah. it, it can spiral and get out of control and just deplete all, all those sources. And that's one of the other reasons why you wanted to get involved in this project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about you, Nala? Um, I was really interested in the programming side to learn how to program, and we've, mm. Margot taught us a few things, or her style was to kind of throw us in there <laughs> and let us um, drown a bit on our own <laughs> and figure it out, I think she said. And then I'm also interested in fish because I really enjoy eating fish, <laughs> and I've lived in Hawaii my whole life, so I'd really like to see it here like being sustained. I'm glad you said that because I, I went to Portugal a couple of weeks ago and I had, I actually had a relationship with a fish. <laughs> I, it was kind of <laughs> one particular sea bass fish. It made me happier than ever before. It was kind of a, an affair, you know, and I think the fish was just as happy as I was. We had an experience together, which I will never forget, <laughs> but I won't dwell on it here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, so what is this project about? You want, you want to spot illegal fishing where? Everywhere? No, just off the coast of Mexico. Well, these guys have been concentrating on the Gulf of Mexico. The other young woman that we're working with, who she couldn't be here today, Tatiana Oje, she's been looking at what's called the tuna belt in the Pacific, so basically from 10 north to 10 south in the Pacific, sort of around all of those islands, Micronesia, where we get... Oh, the western Pacific. Mm. Western oh, Pacific, okay, okay. where we get lots of illegal fishing going on. Um, so we could be doing it anywhere but right now because of the fact that we had about a year and an incredible amount of data we've been concentrating on these areas okay data how do you get data on illegal fishing you take out the illegal spectrometer and you <laughs> put it on a satellite and you look down and it it flashes red if it's illegal why so uh <laughs> i'm only kidding <laughs> so basically we get it, well, it's called AIS data. It stands for Automatic Identification System. And I think the easiest way to describe what AIS is is that it's the air traffic control of the ocean. So pretty much all uh, commercial ships that are cruising around the world are equipped with these AIS transceivers. And they're identified. Then. They're identifying um, their 
constantly sending out this this AIS signal. Uh, so based on that, it's we all our data isn't just illegal fishing. It's all ships. So we have to parse through the data. Well, that's interesting. And that, that we have the technology to do yes, that now. Yeah. yeah. So if if it's not on a legal list, if what is reported back to you from the AIS system is not on the legal list, then what? You make some conclusions about it, you write that down, and you keep data on that. You know who is legit and who is not. Sort of. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of grays, shades of gray in this kind of stuff. There yeah. are people who are legit who do illegitimate things. There are people who claim to do one thing, who do a, uh, something completely different. There are people who go in areas where they're not supposed this to go. This is like a whodunit here. Right. This is like CIS. <laughs> and then there's this really crazy stuff. Like one of the areas where Nalu was working, we saw these things. We, we ended up calling them crop circles. And we, we ended up going to the Coast Guard to see what the crop circles are. Do you want to talk about those yeah, a little, what's Nalu? what's a crop circle? Yeah, so it just appeared that there were four tracks of ships going in a perfect circle in the southern part of the Gulf of Mexico. And we didn't really know why they were doing that because it was only recorded a few times in our data. You know, I'm sitting here trying to think of why they might do such a thing, and I'm not getting anything. Yeah. Why? That's a good question. We you actually don't know. Don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There must be a reason. Well, there's possibilities. I mean, there could be errors in the data. And that was what was really cool, I think, was Nolly went to the Coast Guard and he got to show them in Houston, the Coast Guard, show them these crop circles and say, what are these? And they scratched their heads. And they've been getting these data too, you know, but it took sort of people who just were looking for different kinds of things to, to be able to see this. aberration. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so what does it mean? So yeah. it's been a really neat trade-off between these guys learning a lot from the Coast Guard, learning a lot from fishermen, and then being able to take unbiased data analysis back to the Coast Guard and say, what's going on here? And we all kind of collectively scratch our heads. That's great. That's great. Because the Coast Guard doesn't have this. I was in the Coast Guard, you know, I spent six years in the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. And they must love to have the feedback from you because it gives them all kinds of new thought process, new possibilities. And they're interested, they're a law enforcement agency. So if they can, if you can help them establish that there's a violation of law, they, I'm sure they really appreciate that. Yeah. So what, what are your theories? Do you have theories about the crop circle? I don't really know. Yeah, that's yeah. strange. <laughs> so wh how, does, how does programming get involved? You like computer programming in this, in this context. What do you do on what platform, what, what language, what result? It's called um, Bash, and it's just kind of strings of code that tells the program what to plot, what colors, what kind of shapes. And it was the first time I ever really got introduced to programming. We use another program, MATLAB, in school, and that's more mathematical based. So it was nice to also learn how to use programming for mapping. Welcome to the world of science. Yeah. You know, it used to be, uh, you know, you'd, all the programming would go on in the computer science department. Now it goes everywhere. Everybody yeah. does programming. <laughs> <laughs> and you must. And it's different, isn't it, than Microsoft? It's really different than consumer kind of programming, like me. <laughs> okay, so what have we learned so far? Um, what conclusions have you drawn? What data have, has come back? And um, how do you feel about it? What is it showing you? Well, there are definitely areas that show a high population of fishing vessels. And what I want to look at specifically is if we can see fishing or fish movement as um, sea temperature rises, so if they're going to go to cooler oh, yeah. waters northward This is more than just the illegal fishing, Margo. This is all kinds of other stuff, too. Yeah, yeah. You know, climate change, Ooh. The interactions between, like, the economic zones between two countries, so Mexico and the U.S. And I'm mainly focusing on the southern portion of the Gulf right now, but I might want to look at other areas just to get a better picture. You, you don't have to go down there. No. You just get satellite data. You can, you can be in your jammies at home and do this work. Yeah. That's typically what I do, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how does what uh, Eamon uh, does, or rather Nalu does, uh, compare and contrast with what you do, Jay? Are you working together as a team, or are you just so doing different things? We're a team looking at separate 
separate aspects of the Gulf of Mexico. So he's looking at the southern portion of the Gulf of Mexico, and I'm looking at the northern portion along the coast of Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, uh, Mississippi, and Florida. And I'm uh, trying to look at the effects of the BP oil spill on fishing oh, yeah. in, in that area. Yeah, so look, look for geographical patterns. One yeah, look another. look for basically fish fishing uh, vessel locations from before the spill compared to where they are now after the spill. So this is all about getting the data, which I guess it's easy to get the data. It's free. It's not it's free. It's not free. It's not free. <laughs> it's not oh my free. God, is it expensive? It is. Uh, yeah. For about about three months of data for these guys, we ended up paying almost five thousand dollars. Okay. But the. That was, we had to go to a commercial vendor. Now the company that we're working with is providing us with data for free. So that was a big part of getting involved with the folks in Houston, which yeah. they're giving us. And it's really interesting and clean data. Um, mm, yeah. So. You know, I mean, to me, that's a big threshold thing. So you, you have it. I mean, you have access to it. And I, I, I don't even know how it comes down to you. How does it come down? It's on a website somewhere. And you can download it. Is it in spreadsheet form? Or is it is just a regular spreadsheet, mm -hmm. but a big spreadsheet. A lot of really, really big <laughs> spreadsheet. <laughs> now you have it. I'm, I'm thinking of it as an Excel spreadsheet or, you know, That's an exactly Apple right. spreadsheet. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so lots of fields, lots of columns, lots of rows, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to know what the columns and rows mean. Mm -hmm. And then you have to be able to interpret that probably geographically, right, onto what amounts to a map. Mm -hmm. And the map moves and changes. Well, how do you do it? So the files, luckily, they, the columns are labeled. So we know exactly what each column represents, what the numbers of the labels and all of that, uh, what they mean. And to map it, we're using what's called generic mapping tool, which was developed at uh, the University of Hawaii. Generic mapping G tool, GMT. GMT. We, we call it GMT. GMT. I thought that was a time mm -hmm. zone. It is, it is a time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're using that to map everything, and it's it's a good software. It maps it clean and makes it very very visually pleasing so to look at. The software looks yes, at the spreadsheet yes. mm -hmm. directly at the spreadsheet, and that that's where a lot of the uh, programming comes in. We have to tell it what to do, where where we want it to uh, plot. Which, which aspects of the, the file, which columns we want it to look at in order to plot and all and of that. And then you make formulae? Tatiana is making yes. formulae. I think that these guys are more sort of looking at geographic location and time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but so it's, it's dynamic. Right, but, but Tati's so actually, she's looking for a certain pattern. So long line fishing tends to create a loop and then a line and a loop and a line and a loop and a line. And so she's developed automatic detection software. You spot loops and lines. Yes. Whoa, that's very, really interesting. Very cool stuff. And she goes in, into the same spreadsheet. Yeah. And the spreadsheet, does the spreadsheet have the AIS information from all the boats, the ships? Yes. So you just, you, you, you track the ship because it's dynamic, it's moving. And so you can get a map from today against the map from tomorrow and so forth. No. Right. So the complication comes in, if you think about the International Space Station, it makes an or orbit every 90 minutes, right? Oh. So it passes over a ship, but then it moves just slightly, or more importantly, the Earth is moves underneath it, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you're never sure if you're going to be able to get that same ship for that loop in the line. So the complication for what Tatiana is doing is she's trying to to fill in that loop and line with just a few sets of points for this this pass and then a few sets of points for this next pass and probably by the third or fourth pass we're away far enough away from that vessel that we can't see it anymore. So it's a really so complicated you gotta, you gotta problem. You for that. You have to have a, form, a formula that will compensate for the movement of the space of the uh, satellite. No? You can. You yeah. can. You have to do some sort of interpolation. Yeah, that's old. pretty sexy yeah. actually. I mean, why do I, well, we'll get to this uh, later, but why do I feel that this opens doors to all kinds of other possibilities for tracking things uh, in the ocean and anywhere else? It does. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that I think that these guys are looking at in particular that's really exciting is this idea of can fish be a proxy, schools of fish, a proxy for what's happening on the planet? An environmental disaster moves the fish one way, 
climate change moves the fish another way and the fishermen follow the fish right? so you don't look at the fish you look at the fishermen looking at the fish That's yes. exactly because right. they're making choices and decisions and and they're spotting the fish so you rely on their judgment that it's commercially motivated so you can rely on it exactly. <laughs> they're, they're basically the experts and we're merely the messengers oh on that note we're gonna have to take a break <laughs> 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 Aloha everybody, my name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi with the Think Tech Hawaii show, Stacy to the Rescue, highlighting some of Hawaii's issues. You can catch it at Think Tech Hawaii on Mondays at 11 a.m. Aloha, see you then. Aloha! How you doing? Welcome to Ibachi Talk. I'm here, Gordo the Tech Star on Think Tech Hawaii. And I'm here with my good old buddy, Andrew the Security Guy. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Aloha. Good to, have him, good, to, good to have Andrew here in the house. Please join us every Friday from 1 to 1.30 and follow us up on YouTube. And remember, as we say at the end of every show, how you, how you doing? doing? What a great experience. I want to go to school again. <laughs> and I don't want to study law, I want to study science. <laughs> it's not too late. Tell me it's not too <laughs> it's late. It's never too late. <laughs> Lifelong learner. <laughs> okay. Oh, we're back. <laughs> we're back. We had a wonderful break. It was a great discussion. We found that it wasn't too late to study science, even for people who haven't thought about it in a long time. So you guys went to Texas, yeah? And, and what happened? So many things. Uh, I think we had a bit too much fun while we were there. Uh, fun in a, we, in a scientific way, of course. Yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> PG-13 way. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll begin at the beginning. What did you do? So we, uh, primary reason we were there was to sort of uh, give our preliminary results of the research to uh, Gems America, who is the uh, who was, f who was funding us uh, through in partnership with NASA. What does JAMS America stand for? JAMS. Yeah. So we were actually talking about this. Uh, <laughs> it stands for Japanese America... S something space support. Okay, it yeah. was Got a it. joint effort between okay. Japan and America uh, good. to support a Japanese astronauts okay. going onto the ISS or the uh -huh. space shuttle. Okay, great. I love those collaborations. Okay. Yeah, huge. Yeah. Okay, so you went and you talked to them. We talked to them. You made presentations to them. Yes. You told them what you were doing and what you were learning, and they were interested, right? They were pretty excited yeah. about everything that was going on. And, uh, yeah, it showed them what, what we were doing, what we had so far, that uh, Exact Earth AAS data that we had. We had uh, made nice maps for them and everything, and just, yeah, told them, g gave them our thoughts of what was going on, and then they gave us theirs, and wow. it was a really nice conversation that we had with them. The most fun thing about science is talking to other scientists, mm -hmm. am I right? Mm -hmm. It is. You share, you know, your high level thinking. Even the arguments are fun. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, were you there in the same thing? Did you make a presentation also? Yeah, all three of us did about a 15 minute presentation, and then we also got feedback from them to see what else. Yeah. They'd like to see or any questions they had or wanted answered. Yeah, when was this? How, how recently was this trip? May. This May. May. Oh, that's May. pretty recent. But then they, they rolled out the red carpet because a lot of these folks had been involved with the space program for a long time. So the very next day, they took us to the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, which was. What is a neutral buoyancy so lab? So, neutral buoyancy is. Neutral buoyancy is when you're in the water, it's, you're just completely suspended in the water. No, not going, floating up, not sinking Sounds down. Sounds like the Red Sea. And that's... You know, the Dead Sea. Yeah, the Dead Sea. <laughs> and that's a really, it's, well, on Earth, it's the best, uh, best way to mimic the effects of zero gravity while they're up at the, mm. uh, on the International Space Station. So the, in this massive pool, which is about 40 feet deep and, I don't know, 100... <laughs> 100 feet long. This is about a million miles away from your 
monitoring the fishing boats. No, but, but it's still it's still really cool. It's still really cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, because it's the space station and the antenna they have, they, that they're using to get their data is on the space station. Okay, got right? it. Got so it. And they have well they have <laughs> mo uh, full size model of the space station in this pool where astronauts train because they when they go they basically re uh, rehearse what they're what they're going to do while they're up on the space station in this pool so the, this must be the, a big pool if it has a, it's, a full it's a size big, it's a big pool yeah. yeah should you go down in the pool i wish no. <laughs> can, I, can, I? <laughs> can i but but you okay now this, this is your turn your to, turn who expose. came out of the pool Oh, um, her name is Megan MacArthur, and she was actually born here, I believe. Mm -hmm. Born and in Honolulu. She's an astronaut, and she was training, and it just so happened that she came out of the pool right at the end of our tour. And so we got to meet her and talk to her about our projects, and that was really cool. Yeah. These guys, of course, you know, as soon as they see her coming out of the pool, they go, oh, Megan MacArthur, right, Google on the phone, right? <laughs> oh, she's born in Honolulu. So they start telling everybody <laughs> in the place, we're from Honolulu. And the next thing we know, she comes over and spent like 15 or 20 yeah. minutes, right, just talking and hanging. And it was really... That is the greatest. It was surprising, you There's know? There's always a connection with Hawaii. I know, I know. And she's actually, uh, she's an oce oceanographer by trade, I guess you could say. Yeah. She has a PhD in oceanography, yeah. so it was pretty cool. Get her, get her to come out here. Yeah. Okay. Recruiting. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so, okay, so uh, wh what else then in Mexico? Anything else? We visited the... Oh, this is Texas. Texas, Texas. Yeah. yeah. We visited the Coast Guard to talk about um, our data sets and ask them about certain ship tracks that we saw that were unusual to get their input. Yeah. And they took us to their uh, command center, uh, which that was really interesting. They it's really top secret. They didn't let us take our phones or cameras or anything in there. Um, well, not, not really top <laughs> secret. But you, you uh, can't and take but your they were showing us their uh, monitoring. What, what they were monitoring of the Houston, the like Texas coast, the Houston. I don't want the bad guys Houston to know how they monitor. Yeah, yeah but mm -hmm. is it was a combat information center kind of thing, or or rescue coordination center? I don't know what they call it these days. They just yeah. call it their command center. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. Where they look at things like this, you know, and you're really kissing cousins that you get the data. They need the data. It's really a good connection. Mm -hmm. But you know what? What what strikes me is that um, these guys are going through the, the kind of the the keyhole here. They're going into science. Um, this is the first time you've done anything like this, uh, this project. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so here you, you get data down from satellites, you interpret the data, you make conclusions about the data, you talk to the government about the data, you talk to industry about the data. You know, you are cooking. <laughs> you are going through the keyhole. And Margot was helping you do that. Yeah. That's what she does. <laughs> she does that with so many students in so many ways. And so so how does this change your view of science? How does it change your view of computer programming? How does it change your view of, of dealing with the environment and the whole world, and all oceans? How does it change your view? What, what, is, what kind of experience do you have? I think it kind of pointed me more in the direction where I want to go after I graduate because I am graduating in the spring. I have developed an interest for more of planning or conservation and this kind of, these kind of tools that I've learned really shows me the path, I guess. When you, when you say that, uh, I guess you're going to do graduate school because you, you need to in that area. But um, are you going to be, you know, an academician, a scientist, a research person? Or are you going to go and try to deal with the government or industry? Any thoughts? I was thinking more towards government jobs, actually. But I wouldn't mind going to grad school. but. Once I graduate, I first want to try to find a job and get more experience. Yeah, okay. How about you, Jay? Uh, so yeah, right, right now it's uh, looking at the military and that this whole in, uh, interacting with the Coast Guard and my, both my parents are uh, military employees. So because of that, it's been, I've kind of been uh, involved with this mil kind of military, Army, Navy uh, atmosphere. So it's, it's been a huge part of my life. So I feel like with my degree, it's just really, I think, obvious next step is to look into the military. 
And what about, um, you know, your view of illegal fishing? What about your view of climate change? Uh, has this experience given you, you know, further thoughts about that? How sensitive are you to those issues now? So I think it's definitely opened my eyes more to uh, illegal fishing than they, I, I wasn't really super aware of, I, I, obviously I was aware of that illegal fishing was going on, but I wasn't really too, uh, concerned about it, I guess. Um, but now with this project, it has really, it's, it's a big issue. And also um, climate change, our, our program is global environmental science. So climate change is a big, huge um, factor of what we're learning about and learning that it is real, it is, uh, it is happening. And that's something that we need to really try to figure out how to stop or yeah. slow down or what happens. There's a, whole, there's a whole sort of sidebar on this thing in terms of what the Chinese are doing in the South China Sea and how they're, you know, pushing people around in the Philippines over it um, and how the oceans become smaller. They, the oceans, are, you know, since you started science, Marco, you must have seen, you know, the oceans now are, they're all right there. Mm -hmm. You can reach out and touch the world now. Mm -hmm. It's different. And science in the oceans is different. It is. It, it does feel like everything's sort of shrinking. And that includes the population of you know, flying fish that used to bump into me when I was out at sea in the 1980s <laughs> versus you know, what I see now. I mean, the, it scares me that the impacts, I, I have seen the impacts to the ocean in my lifetime. I, that just astonishes me. And you know, one of the things that, to echo Jay's point, you know, when you start going and talking to the Coast Guard and to NOAA and you hear the numbers that something like 30% of the fish that end up on our plate were caught illegally in this country, even though we don't try and, you know, do that. We try and play by the rules. But, you know, the system, the system has problems and there are people that are taking advantage of the problems. And, it's folks like these that give me hope, right? That, you know, when I retire and you retire and we just go read cool books and learn interesting stuff, you got it. that these guys are gonna pick up these important questions and yeah. do something about it. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's not only science, though. It disconnects with uh, international law and the law of the sea and diplomacy, for that matter. Mm -hmm. we, we have to be sensitive to that as a country and as a new president, by the way. Uh, <laughs> And, and, you know, because the oceans are smaller, um, it, is more, it is of greater interest to all of humanity that they be properly governed. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're really getting into an area that is more than science. It's the way humankind deals with this enormous resource, which is not so enormous anymore. <laughs>